question about the Harvard socioeconomic sciences, then I'll say something about the trend or position of the social sciences. Then I'll go on to say something about how social scientists should position themselves. And finally, we shall have a conclusion of our lecture. To start with the information about the Faculty of Social Economic Sciences. As you're all aware, Social Economic Sciences is one of the faculties in Cavendish University, Uganda. And we offer programs in the social sciences that include both masters, undergraduate, and then a certificate course. We have two masters programs, one of them being masters in international relations and diplomacy and masters of security studies. We have three bachelor's programs. We have bachelor's in international relations and diplomatic studies, and we have bachelor's in journalism and communication studies, as well as bachelor's of public administration and management. Then we also host the higher education certificate course. This program is specifically for those students who would want to join university for a bachelor's program, but they did not have the qualifications required to join a bachelor's straight away. Therefore, if for instance you are a Ugandan who did your senior six, your OA levels, and you got one principal pass instead of the two principal passes that are required for you to join university, then you can join Cavendish University of Uganda for a higher education certificate program where you will study for one year and then be enrolled for a bachelor's. Under the higher education certificate, we have options. We have the humanities, we have the physical sciences, and we have the biological sciences. The humanities will lead you to doing humanities courses, including law, then and business, physical sciences can take you to business and then uh, some other like IT courses. Then biological sciences will take you to medicine, to public health and other sciences. So please join us at Social Economic Sciences on one of the programs as listed above. The aims of our programs at the Faculty of Social Economic Sciences. We aim to equip learners with an ability to question. We aim to equip learners with thinking critically, that is with critical thinking skills. We also aim to conduct research on population challenges. We also aim to enhance the communication or, or communication skills for our students so that they can communicate effectively. And then we aim to help students to be in position to make decisions and adopt to change. These are among some of the aims, considering the many that we have. Then to go to the current trend and position of social sciences. As you may be aware, the world today is putting a lot of emphasis on the natural sciences, the physical sciences, and the biological sciences. And I'm starting this discussion with, uh, with a few questions. Can man do without understanding the social challenges that are a fact of man's existence? And is everything going to be solved or replaced by science, technology, engineering, and math? And also, we have the fear and talk that artificial intelligence, AI, will replace human beings. I think it, this is a topic that is very common right now. People are talking about artificial intelligence, they are talking about robotics and uh, the fourth industrial revolution with this fear that uh, machines are going to replace man. However, some scholars argue that artificial intelligence and machines are created by man for the purpose of serving, serving man's goals and objectives. And therefore, technology by itself has no objectives and goals to pursue. And therefore they are a function of man. 
And going by this, my argument here is we need technology, but since man is behind all the technology for solving money's objectives and goals, the problems, the objectives and the goals that man is going to solve are suited in the sociological field as well. And therefore, it makes the position of the social sciences as relevant as the position of the, 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 the STEM programs and IT in general. And again, by the fact that man is a social animal, social problems need more social solutions than technology. You may agree with me that uh, in governance, it could be social governance, it could be any form of governance that impact us. We cannot solve it with technology alone. We have issues of peace and conflict. And so we have these organizations trying to strive for peace in the world. I don't think that uh, using technology. We have challenges. is facing today. We've had issues of people dying, trying to cross seas and oceans from one continent to another. And then when they reach where they think is their heaven, they are again blocked. Some of them die on the way. I mean, those challenges can only be solved by sociological solutions. We have challenges of poverty and others associated challenges with poverty. It is only sociology that can help us at some, at some moments. We have issues of resource distribution. Yes, we can produce resources, but how are they distributed? Are they distributed in such a way that uh, they're benefiting all people or we are distributing them in a way that uh, they're for a particular group of people and we are creating a lot of inequalities. So all those are concerns of the social sciences that require that as social scientists, we position ourselves in this context of technological advancement well, so that we continue being relevant. I'll give an example, for instance. Personally, I, I'm convinced that uh, when we are hit by COVID-19 in the year 2020, the immediate standard operating procedures for, COVID, for curbing COVID-19 were lockdowns, hand washing, social distancing, and no shaking hands. And all these SOPs were from the sociological perspective. And even later on, when the vaccines were introduced, still emphasis was put on lockdown, emphasis was put on social distancing, emphasis was put on hand washing, emphasis was put on no shaking hands even among those people who had taken the vaccine. And unless society or unless a population, either small population or global population accepts to partake of these SOPs, if they did not accept, then perhaps we do not have solved the problem of COVID-19. So besides technology, there's always need that society, man being a social animal, social issues, also are addressed by social solutions. So having said this, how then can a social scientist position themselves in the era of technological advancement in a context where many people are talking about STEM, promoting STEM? It is saddening that, uh, yeah, even in countries like Uganda, the president, that is our president, His Excellency, Joel Kabuta Museveni, 
has on several occasions. Of course, I, I don't oppose the, 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 the promotion of STEM. I mean, it is good, but uh, there's a talk, a tendency to talk down on humanities and the social sciences. There is this saying that uh, we send our children to university to study things that are not relevant. So creating a perception that uh, if you are to study something relevant, then it has to be science, technology, engineering, and math. And yet we are seeing here that the social sciences remain relevant. So it is as social scientists to demystify the perceptions, the attitude people have towards the social sciences, because uh, in my own understanding, in my own view, we need each other. Science needs sociology, we need the social sciences, we need technology, we need math. We need to function in totality in collaboration. But how does a social scientist position themselves so that, uh, yeah, as people promote STEM, we also promote the social sciences. I'm going to use four concepts to explain this, and that is what is going to guide the rest of my presentation. The four concepts are good work and friendship. It is a concept that was advanced by a scholar called Senate reflection and discretionary practice advanced by Sarah Banks. Then there is normative professionalism that is advanced by Kahneman. Then finally, I'll talk about professional institutional engagement. And this is a concept that was coined by myself during my PhD as my theoretical explanation to whatever I was doing. Coming to the first concept of good work and craftsmanship, social science position themselves, like the title goes, we need to do good work in the world. A good as a craft an object that is desirable that is due admired that is recommended that is commendable this look mired and and put it on the good social speech and most I think uh, what what have we was we have portray that good work. We are simply doing work for the sake of it. We don't bother whether what we are doing is a good job or not a good job. And craftsmanship and good work also involves striving for perfection, perfecting your work. I mean, we all make mistakes in the process of working, in the process of interacting with one another. But as a social scientist, strive for perfection. Yes, you, you, you can do something wrong. You may not do it well. You may not do it 100% perfect, but keep improving so that at the end of the day, you have something. It may not be completely perfect, but you're striving for perfection. Or if you're able to reach that perfection well and good, that is what we all desire. And that is what can promote a social scientist. It also requires that we have outputs that others are proud of and you yourself are proud of. Do your work. And when you are reflecting, when you are doing a personal evaluation, you should be proud of what you've done. And other people should also be proud of what you've done. And that is what counts as good work and craftsmanship. Conduct research to be equipped with knowledge on the basics. Yes, like a craftsman is always striving for perfection. I'll give an example. 
A person who is inventing a computer will have a version for 2001, will have a version for 2018, will have a version for 2020, will have a version for 2021, will have a version for 2023. A social scientist doing research so that we move with a trend and we are producing knowledge that is relevant to the current situation or, or that the, of the issues that the population is facing. Or we tend to lose ourselves in the world and we don't care to do research that can keep us updated about the current trends. So we need that as scientists are innovating. Social scientists should also innovate as much as possible in as far as doing research and bringing new knowledge is concerned. Then we need to acquire, for instance, best computer skills so that technology moves with us. So our craftsman is trying to improve. Our social scientists should also immerse themselves in technology. We have cases of, for instance, students and even the general population who have phobia for even touching the keyboard for the computer. Many of us are very comfortable touching the keyboard for our, our phones, but when someone puts a computer before you, you get phobia. I mean, we need to get those simple skills so that as we are, as we are working as social scientists, we can also make use of these technologies and we keep updated, we keep with the trend so that we are not lost. Like I said in the beginning, we need to work hand in hand. Social science is important, technology is important. So as social scientists, we need to tap from technology as people in technology are also tapping into the social sciences. Make a brand of yourself with admirable values and principles. That will help you to be a good worker. That will help you to be a good craftsman. There's a tendency of people promoting mediocrity, substandard work. I mean, for instance, a, a, a social scientists are supposed to write reports, project planning and management. You're running a project, you're running an NGO, you, you're, you're working in public service somewhere, and you're supposed to be writing reports. Cases, we don't make any brand of these reports. We don't care how we write the report. We don't know, we don't care what we put forward. We are simply recycling. When social scientists are hired or when they are consulted to do research, many of them will simply recycle information without even bothering to go out there and find out what is new. So this issue of doing desk research without uh, connecting it with empirical research and coming up with strategies and solutions that can help in attaining to population problems and issues makes people not to take high consideration for the social sciences because we are telling them the obvious. There's nothing new that they are seeing. So if you keep doing that, I mean, things in the same way, telling the same information without adding anything new, then people will not see any value in what we are doing. I'm sure we all know this. Even yesterday, I was... Uh, listening to, to news and there was an MP who was blaming others about the reports that were that are produced every year. And this was in regard to the scandal of iron sheets in Karamoja. So the question was, we've always had problems about Karamoja and, and uh, inquiries have always been done, but we don't come up with anything substantive. So is there anything new that is going to come up out with this kind of iron sheet? So they were questioning. I mean, all those are the responsibilities of social scientists. If people are not seeing anything new out of the commissions of inquiry, then going to tell us means that uh, you're doing something right, doing yourself. You have values that are admirable. You have principles. You're doing the right thing. You're keeping updated. I'll add on this with other concepts. Uh, and with, uh, with Nelson Mandela, I'm told that uh, whoever works remembers him for punctuality among all other traits that he had. I listened to a documentary and one of his former permanent secretaries said that uh, if Nelson Mandela, if you have an, a meeting which was to be chaired by Nelson Mandela, he would always be at this meeting first and he would come with his notebook and he would keep recording 
the time when people are entering and their names. So when he did that, people will know. Of course, you'll find him seated already and he, he'll record you and then he'll talk about it. Then in the process, people come to know that time management and punctuality is very, very important. So what brand are we creating for ourselves that can position us adequately out there in public so that we are also valued, so that we are respected when we are doing our work? We have weaknesses in public administration. Time management, people tell you it is an African thing to be late. Sincerely, how do you normalize something that is not normal? So when we normalize dishonesty, no punctuality, substandard work, and all that is normalized, then how is society going to value the social scientists? So in summary, what I'm trying to say is good work and craftsmanship is concerned with doing a job, not just for the sake of it, but striving to do a good job. So that at the end of the day, the people that you're serving will value and appreciate the work that you've done for them. I'll move to another concept, and that is uh, the concept of reflection and discretionary practice. Uh, when you talk about reflection, according to a scholar, Donald Sean, you can reflect in action or reflect on action. Reflection in action is when you're doing something, you should always reflect on it. Think about it. Think about what you're doing as you're doing, as you're doing it. Are you doing the right thing? Are you serving the people well? Are you writing this report well? Are you connecting with people in a good way? Is it a right thing you're doing? Reflect on it. When you reflect on something, like I said earlier on, it helps you to perfect because in the process, as you think about what you're doing while you're doing it, it helps you to identify some of the gaps where you're going wrong. And it helps you to keep perfecting. If it requires asking or seeking intervention of another person, when you reflect, you know that here I'm not doing it well. But perhaps there's a colleague in my team who can help me to perfect it. Then you get a colleague in that team who can help you to do it. So we need to reflect in action. Then reflect on action means that when you do something, you have to do a post-mortem of whatever you have done, whatever activity you've engaged in, whatever project that you've run, whatever task that has been assigned to you and you've, you've done it, you need to reflect on action. And reflect on action means you do a post by thinking backwards. Did I do the right thing? What did I do well? What can I do better considering what I did? What went right? What went wrong? What facilitated me to succeed? So reflection is very important. Yes, yes. Okay. Then apart from reflecting in action and, uh, and on action, reflect upon and exercise professional knowledge and judgment. As social scientists, we are in school. But how are we taking the knowledge that we acquire, especially the professional knowledge that we acquire from schools, from institutions of learning into practice? How do we reflect it in making judgments? I mean, when you go to, to, to the communities today, you'll get people commenting about a graduate of today. They'll tell you that there's no difference between a graduate of today and a local village person. Just because of what the graduate is talking, they are not reflecting any knowledge in their judgment. So if you're talking and reasoning and acting in the same way, as any other person who is looking onto you as someone with professional knowledge and judgment, then how are people going to 
respect us. Yes, we are social scientists. We are dealing with society. We are living in society. We are not saying that be different from them, but what value are you adding on to them? What knowledge, what judgments, what thing are you adding? If you get people in an argument, you as a social scientist who has read about peace and migration and the poverty and food security and other problems of humanity, what advice are you giving these people? Are you adding anything new? So when you do that, and like I said earlier on, it is through research and getting knowledge that you can be able to reflect and give professional knowledge and judgment on certain things. Reflection and discretion is also about questioning yourself and addressing issues of self-respect, self-doubt, trust and mistrust, and taking steps towards positive improvement. When you reflect on what you're doing as a social scientist or whatever professional you are, you are questioning the self. Like I said, nobody is perfect. We are always learning, we always error. Therefore, you question yourself as you're doing something. Yes, how am I doing it? Am I doing it right? We always have issues of self-doubt. Sometimes you doubt yourself because it is natural that you doubt yourself. So questioning the self and addressing issues of self-doubt where you doubted yourself. Self-respect, you need to respect yourself. Like they said, respect yourself before others respect you. Did you present yourself with respect to this group of people that you're serving, that, the people that you addressed? So when you do that, then people will respect you. Issues of trust and mistrust. Yes, when you reflect on certain issues, you are working with people, you are working with, with a population, you're trying to solve problems, you're going, trying to input. But did you handle issues of trust and mistrust? Because it is always there. And taking steps towards positive improvement. When you reflect, don't just reflect for the sake of reflecting, but you should take steps towards positive improvement. Then re-evaluating, questioning, and giving up previously held ideas and principles. I just mentioned that uh, as social scientists, we should be equipped with new knowledge. We should be learning continuously so that we have new information, we have new knowledge, we are, conf we, we are having new techniques and strategies solving problems. So when you have new strategies for solving problems and new information, it helps you, it helps you to give up previously held ideas and principles because the world is not static, the world is moving and social problems are not static as well. For instance, uh, at the moment, we have a current problem of social media. It is a very huge problem to society. But how many of us are questioning the issues of social media and how it is impacting society? Of course, I know there are people who are dealing with it, but just question yourself. What new information are you having on current or contemporary social problems? And what ideas do you have? Which ideas are you ready to drop and which ideas are you ready to, 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 to hold on or and which new ideas are you bringing up? So when you do that as a social scientist, you're positioning yourself to be relevant to society. Then we, not, we need also to acquire virtues such as good thoughts and good acts. This should become part of our existence. When you reflect, it helps you to avoid some wrongs. Avoid some wrongs. You'll strive towards doing it good. You'll have good thoughts. You have, you, 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 you'll start acting in a good way because as you question, is it the right thing? Is it the wrong thing? What can I do better? What helped me to do better? Who helped me to do this? How did I reach where I am? Whether you've reached a wrong side or a right side, each of it has consequences. So when you question, when you keep questioning and reflecting, it creates good acts, it, it creates good thoughts. And then at the end of the day, you'll be a better social scientist as compared to one who does not reflect continuously. The other concept that we're talking about is a, a concept of normative professionalism. Yeah, professionalism is about being efficient and effective. It is about developing a strong connection to your work, 
and confronting work realities with more personal responsibility. It also about having a strong understanding of the realities of the work environment and adopting certain innovations that respond successfully to the situation. Professionalism is also about bringing about more responsive ways of dealing with institutional based problems in a polygon manner. It also requires reflecting on issues and coming up with meaningful ways of addressing problems and dilemmas. Maybe to say something before I go to the, to the, to the other slide. Normative, as you hear the word, is from norm. So normative professionalism is more or less like you have a normal profession. Who strives towards doing the good thing? And if a social scientist tries to becoming a normative professional, who has a strong connection to their work, who is looking at work realities with personal responsibilities, who is having a strong understanding of the realities of the work environment, who is understanding the innovation that responds successful to the situation, then your relevance will be filled. I will talk about, for instance, understanding the realities of the work environment and adopting certain innovations that respond successfully to the situation. Our work environments are different. Every work environment is different. Some are more deprived, others are better. Some facilitate you more, others don't facilitate. Some have some equipment to use like computers, others don't have. Some institutions will give you more time for research, others may not give you time for research. I mean, every must understand or embed yourself within the reality of the institution where you're working, within the reality of the profession for which you're serving. There are professions that are marginalized, so to say. For instance, it is not a lie, it is a reality that for instance, the teaching profession has been marginalized for long. While teachers do a lot of work, there's little recognition for the teachers. Teachers are among the least paid professionals in the world, apart from few countries like Finland, like German, where teachers are paid highly. But the work of teacher of a teacher goes with very minimal payment. There's a lot of work that we go that we do that goes unrealized and recognized because as a teacher. Uh, with my concept, as you'll see later, you're not only reflecting on action, you're not only reflecting in action, but it's a continuous process because teaching and learning does not end in the classroom. As a teacher, I carry my work home. I carry my work on any journey I take. I carry my work to the disco hall. I carry my work to the cinema. I'm always thinking about what I'm going to teach tomorrow, what I taught yesterday. I go to the bar, I'll meet there my students, and they'll bring something to deal with Cavendish University. I go to a restaurant, the students are there, and I reflect on how I taught them. So it is a continuous process. So we need to understand all those realities and see how to deal with them. So when you do that, when you understand the realities of your work, the nature of your work, then you'll, you, you, you'll come up with strategies of how to deal with your work. Because my work as a teacher, is different from the work of an IT specialist. It is different from the work of a market vendor. It is different from the work of a, a, a person serving in a restaurant. So every work will make certain demands on you. And therefore, to be a relevant social scientist, you should be in position to understand the realities of your work environment, what is demanded of you by the clients, by the people that you're serving, what is demanded of you from your bosses, what is demanded of you from your colleagues? All this will help you to be a better professional as compared to one who does not consider this reflect, reflection on normative, normativism and normative professionalism. I'll continue to, to another slide. 
Normative professionalism is also about embodying strong values. There is this quote that uh, unless you can be employed, you can't be employed. I'll repeat, unless you can be employed, you can't be employed. And I think that is one of the challenges that we have in the social sciences. Question yourself, can you be employed for you to be employed? Can I be employed for me to be employed? So unless you can be employed, you can't be employed. So as a social scientist, position yourself in you and this can be by among other things embodied strong values values of good disposition and attitude to work i mean for me sometimes i'm so critical and uh, yeah, that is my weakness and maybe the people i work with sometimes think that uh, i should say they think that uh, I, I, i'm too much or maybe i critique a lot but somehow i'm critical because uh, the truth is most of the people that we train today, most of the young generation today, the millennials at work, their disposition to work is so negative. Their attitude to work is so negative. You go to someone's office and this person is simply on their phone. They are checking messages. They are turning to their colleagues and they are WhatsApping. They are they call them Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. They are busy. Someone is busy on the phone and the queue is building up. People are waiting to be served, but for you, you're on the phone. How will people serve, value you? I mean, these are human beings who also make judgment of you. So you need to be at least be strict with what you're doing. Have a good disposition. Why should you wait for the people, for the queue, for the line to pile up, for the crowd to pile up before you start attending to people? Then you, you, you appear to be so urgent and, and, and overwhelmed with work. And yet you created it. If one person came and you served this one person and the person went away, the person will go away happy and praising you for attending to them early. A second one comes, you serve them third, don't wait for the crowds. Then you appear like you're so busy and now I'm, I'm so urgent. You know, you people are so many. I, I need to have breakfast. I'm hungry. But you spent a lot of time on your phone, which is not part of your work. Can we have a good disposition and attitude to work as social scientists who are dealing with the human beings? Human beings judge us. Human beings are looking at us for certain things. They are looking at us for certain values. So if you don't present yourself in a way that a fellow human being will appreciate you in their service to them, then they will not value you as a social scientist. Then you need to have courage. You need to be responsible. Truthfulness, being consistent in one's behavior and not divided. Yes, today you're this, tomorrow you're that. I mean, people should have a certain description of you, whether they describe you as a body person. Sometimes when you, when you have certain principles, people take you to be wrong, especially in our society today where there's a lot of social anomaly. By social anomaly, I mean, there's a lot of rot in society today that when some talk about some of the abnormalities, about some of the wrong things that happen in society, then you will become the bad seed. You'll be the bad one. Everybody will hate you. And we tend to get into to be submerged with the majority, even when we know they are wrong. Our behavior is divided, it is compromised. But normative professionalism is not about being compromised. It is not about being divided. It is about being consistent in one's behavior, no matter the circumstances. I mean, if something is right, even if a hundred say it is, it, I mean, if something is right, even if a hundred say it is wrong, 
you should stand by your word and say this is wrong. Of course, you can add that, okay, even if I accept your stand, I'm simply following because it is a vote perhaps, but I'll still remain, my conscience tells me it is, it is, it is right. Or my conscience tells me it is wrong. So don't be compromised. Then you should have passion and commitment to your work. I've indicated in the slide that it is a major challenge. Oh my God. In Africa, in Uganda, passion and commitment is a major challenge. Many of us are in the jobs that we are not passionate about. And therefore, we are simply doing a job for money. And of course, which money is not even enough. We are doing a job for survival. So we cannot even say we are doing for money, but we are doing it for survival. And because we are simply doing the job for survival, we are not passionate about what we are doing. But leave that alone. Many of us are, are in professions that we don't love. We went to these professions as a last resort. Maybe that is the cost that you're able to pay for at university. Maybe your parent forced you to do that course or to enroll for that program. Maybe at the time when, when you went to university, you got certain points and uh, the powers that you could only do this, be enrolled for this program and not the other. So at the day, we don't realize our passions in relation to the work that we are doing. So you're simply waking up in the morning, but when you wake up in the morning, you're not looking forward to your job. Instead, you're worrying about what you're going to do. You don't love, you're not passionate about it. And therefore, you cannot commit to what you don't love. I'm not saying that, uh, yeah, people should drop whatever they are, go, they are doing and go back and, and do what they are passionate about. But by reflecting, I've already talked about reflective practice. Reflecting about your work will enable you to strive to perfection. It will guide you to avoid certain extremes. And you, you, you also try to borrow some values that can help you to develop passion and commitment to your work. But we can also see that passion and commitment to work can also be derived through maybe upskilling, reskilling. All those can help you to have better passion and commitment to the work. You need to have sacrifice. I've already mentioned that uh, sometimes we are not passionate about what we do because we are simply surviving. The money is not enough. You are going home, you don't know whether you're going to have a meal. You wake up in the morning and you have to walk a distance in the rain or in the dust to get a taxi to come to work, you're abused by this taxi driver or a taxi tout the conductors because you, you, you don't have enough money, maybe they're asking for 2,000 and you have 1,000 K, you're bargaining with this person, all that kills passion and commitment. But here we, we say as a professional, you need some sacrifice. Sacrifice is very important. When you sacrifice your time, when you sacrifice to reach work early, despite the challenges that you face, wake up in the morning, wake up early, take the early bus, be at your workplace at 10, I mean, at, at, at 7 or at 8 o'clock than arriving at 10 because arriving at 10 is not going to, 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 to add to the poverty that you're suffering or it's not going to reduce. Still, you're going to suffer. You, you're getting the little money. So we need to sacrifice. If you're doing something, you know, my job, my work requires me to be there at 8 o'clock. For goodness sake, try to be there at 8 despite the challenges that you're facing. I've already said, understand the work environment and know how to deal with it. Live within your means. I mean, we all want good things. I also want them, but yeah, maybe we pray, always talk about prayer, but sacrifice is very important. Empathy is very important. As social scientists, we are serving human beings. We are interacting with human beings. Empathize with them, sympathize with them. Put yourself in their shoes. Oftentimes, when you go to people's offices, like I said, you'll get this person on phone. 
And a person will start attending to people after phone, they are talking about what is on TikTok, what is on Facebook, what is on uh, social media. Then 10 o'clock is when this person comes to start opening the laptop. Which laptop is also going to take time to open, like mine happened before this, uh, this, this, this webinar. It took time. I started at, uh, at 11.50, but it was not opening. So we have those challenges. So by the time someone comes to attend to you, it is so many hours lost. Then they'll serve you from 11 o'clock up to midday and midday someone is hungry. I need to go for lunch, come back in the afternoon. Are you empathizing with people? Are you sympathizing with them? This is someone who was there as early as eight o'clock, but you're telling them at half past, past midday to come back at two o'clock. Then the poor person does not even have a meal. They have waited since morning. They'll wait, they'll, they'll just go and sit under three to wait for you to come back at two. At two o'clock, they come to sit again. For you, you come at three. Then at three, you first tell people about lunch. You're talking to colleagues about lunch, about a challenge, about what you saw, about now TikTok during lunch. Then you start serving them at 3.30. Come four o'clock, you tell them, now it is time to go and pick my children from school. Or maybe there is traffic. I have to go and stay far. Please come back tomorrow. That's what we do to people. I've always asked my, some people that when you tell me coming back tomorrow, it is like if it is a storage building, it is like I stay on top of you. I will simply use a lift and press a button and come to your office. Or maybe I'm leaving before you. I'll simply press a lift, a button, and a lift will carry me to your office. You don't know where these people came from. You don't know whether they even have the money. You don't know what they are going through. But someone will come to your office for a whole month, even more than a month. I'm told if you apply for pension or you're applying for your money from, from NSSF, I've not yet experienced it, but it can take years. You'll go to those offices until you become more or less part of them. So are we empathetic? Are we, are, 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 we, are we caring about other people? Are we caring about their needs and problems and desires? So if we don't do that as social scientists, if you treat me like that, then how are people going to value you? It means you're not respecting yourself and therefore people are not going to respect you. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. That is Kant's categorical imperative. If you don't do that, people are not going to value you because you're not doing to them what they would want, what, what you'd want from them. Then embrace lifelong learning. Yes, we are in the era of technological advancement. Like I said in the beginning, we need to bring the two, the two are intertwined. When we talk about lifelong learning, I've already mentioned about skilling, reskilling, and upskilling. We should learn, we should acquire new knowledge. If there's something that has come up, for instance, when the COVID-19 hit institutions of learning, many of us did not know the things about uh, teaching online. We didn't know about these Zoom meetings. We didn't know about uh, planet, we didn't know about so many things. But here we are, we are social scientists, but we've embraced technology and we are able to transform, we are able to teach using technologies. And this comes with lifelong learning, accepting to learn continuously so that you acquire new knowledge. Something has come up, run for it, acquire some skill there so that you're building your skills base from one level to another. So normative professionalism is about continuous learning as well. Embrace lifelong learning, become a lifelong learner so that you have or you equip yourself with skills that are relevant. You have something new to, to give. Then finally, also strive to acquire practical skills, soft skills that are relevant for the world of work. For instance, discipline, respect, communication, Presentation, some of them have talked, I'll talk about presentation, the way we present ourselves, the way we present ourselves, first of all, our dress code, our talking, 
how we position ourselves when we go to society there. How are you positioning yourself? Are you positioning yourself with respect so that people can also respect you? Also in relation to this position, soft work like practical skill, I mean, teamwork should be promoted. You have to be a team player, know how to work with others. Time management, I already mentioned it with Mandela. Are we able to manage time? If we are making others stressed to cry because we are not man managing time, then they will not talk about us well. When you do good things, that is when people can talk well of you. Okay. Then uh, finally, I'll talk about professional institutional engagement. Like I said in the beginning, I, I'm very passionate about, uh, about this concept because uh, I coined it during my PhD. I, out, after studying the other concept of, of reflective practice, reflect in action and on action, normative professionalism and uh, good work and craftsmanship. My addition to my PhD was that uh, in addition to doing all the above, then we also need to engage with a profession. Why did I come up with this word, with this concept? Is because uh, I was doing research with the teachers, and teachers are working in very deprived work environments. Of course, other professionals may, but I'll use the example that I used. Teachers are working in deprived environments. The classrooms are dilapidated; they don't have their homes, so they. Most teachers don't seem to see anything good. You're going to this classroom that is falling, you're having a student that are sitting down on the floor, which is not clean. You're having thousands of children. Of course, I'm not talking about our schools in brackets. I'm talking about real schools. So for you to work well, you have to engage with both your profession and the institution for which you're working. You have to understand the institutional context in which you work. You have to understand that there's a difference from one institution to another. I already mentioned in terms of facilities, in terms of facilitation, in terms of the people you're going to meet, how they are going to take you through the orientation program and so on. All those impact your work. So as you change, of course, we always change from one institution to another social scientists. As we move from one institution to another, we should learn to engage with our profession. Don't leave your profession behind. I've already talked about normative professionalism. So engage with your profession. What does my profession require of me? What skills do I require? What skills best do I have? What lifelong skills should I acquire in order to improve my profession? What soft skills do I have? What is it that I can acquire in order to build on what I already have? So understand the demands of your profession and see how you can embed this within the institution. You know very well that the institution is depriving. Maybe you want a computer and the computer is there, it's not there. You want internet and maybe internet is not forthcoming. This is when things of sacrifice comes in. Many of us during COVID, for instance, we used to use our own phones to, to, to conduct lectures because people did not have computers. Other people were using their own money to buy MBs in order to be able to conduct an online lecture or lesson for the students. That is a sacrifice. It means you're engaging with your institution, you're understanding your work environment and you're trying to fit in there by being creative and bringing in some innovations and sacrificing, and you're able to deliver at the end of the day. So professional institutional engagement is understanding both your profession, but also understanding the institution, the realities within the institution where you work, so that you don't say for me, when I was working at Makerere University, this were the conditions. The conditions at Makerere are different from Cavendish. The conditions at Cavendish are different from Harvard. The conditions of Harvard are different from the conditions at Oxford. The conditions at Oxford are different from conditions in the in, 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 in universe of Malawi. So we should be able to understand all those realities, but be able to fit in at some point. So when you do that, of course, I've used universities because that is what 
where I work. But for those of you who are working elsewhere, you need to understand that condition, conditions differ from one context to another. You may be moving from one district to another. Districts differ. Karamoja is different from Kampala. Facilities in Karamoja are different from facilities in Kampala or Kasese or whatsoever. Everywhere is different. You're going to meet new people. You're going to meet uh, new circumstances. So you need to engage with all that. Then uh, professional institutional engagement also involves being prepared to be part of the decision-making process, but also problem solving. Institutions have problems. Are you able to belong to this institution, own the problems in the institution, and be part of the problem solving process? There, it means you understand the institution, you are solving problems, and you will be valued by the client or other stakeholders that will know you, that will find you in this institution. There should be collecting learning, collect, sorry, collective learning. There should be openness. There should be dialogue. Again, the aspect of self-respect and respect for others is very important as far as engaging with your profession and the institution is concerned because you're working with other people. Man is a social animal. And we spend most of our time at the workplace. So we should need to dialogue. We should need to respect each other because a workplace is a social place. It should be a place where we find comfort, where we find laughter, because we all leave home early morning, like for instance in Kampala with the high traffic. Most of us leave home as early as six o'clock. You leave when it is dark. And you reach your house as late as 10, even beyond 10 when it is dark. Implying that we spend the rest of our day at the workplaces. So what environment are we creating at the workplaces? that are helping us to grow. We need to engage with our institutions and find ways of doing things that can enable us to have mutual living and interactions and understanding and help each other to fit well in the institution because that is where we spend most of our time anyway. Creating learning communities and taking responsibility for professional practice. Yeah. I'll use again the, the, the example of what is going on right now, the scandal of iron sheets in Uganda. Yesterday when I was uh, listening to the news, I saw a reading below what always, a screen that always showing the thing. Okay, she also didn't know, but they were given to her. She didn't know the circumstances that which was given. And she was saying everyone should take personal responsibility. I think even the, the finance minister also said the same thing. Everyone should take personal responsibility. We should avoid the blame game. But again, the minister for Karamoja has kept quiet. She has not said anything. From the time the scandal unfolded until today, she has not given any, any form of report. She has gone silent as people are talking. So there you ask questions. Is she caring about the people? Is she concerned? As the MPs from Karamoja are raising their anger, the person that is implicated in distributing the iron sheets is quiet. Are we empathizing with others? Are we engaging with our professions? Are we engaging with our responsibilities? If you are a minister for Karamoja and such a scandal has come, what would be the most responsible step to take to help maybe address the problem? Is keeping quiet the best thing? I don't know. Perhaps to hide is the best thing, but we should take responsibility for professional practices and accept criticism. When you know you've done wrong and people have critiqued you, accept it because we are human beings, we are not gods. Then you need to strike a balance between personal, collegial, professional, and institutional demands and values. Colleagues and everyone on this call, you should all know that we all have personal values. We all have personal choices. We have personal likes and dislikes. 
which influence the decisions that we make. We don't leave these things at home, we move with them. Everyone moves with their personal values. Everyone moves with what they desire. We don't leave them anywhere. We're always bringing them to our workplaces. Then we, we meet our colleagues. So when we reach Cavendish University, you're meeting colleagues who have also come with their own desires, with their own expectations, with their own values, with their own problems. Then you have this profession that is also demanding of values, do this, you mark on time, do this on time, do this and the other. Then you have these institutional demands. I mean, you need to strike a balance between all of them, personal values, political values, professional values, and institutional demands and values. Strike a balance, find a leveling ground so that you're having all of them guide you in your work practices. There you'll be a more valid professional than one who does not go by that. So beside the principles, and I mean the four concepts that I've just explained, I added on others. Community outreach is very important for a social scientist to be visible, to position themselves. You know, many social scientists, when they are studying, you are, for instance, students and us, maybe the lecturers, we are always within the confines of the ivory towers, the ivory tower mentality. We are always there, the, 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 the knowledgeable ones, the educated ones. And when we get out of our ivory towers, we straight away enter offices. We rarely interact or involve with actual problems in the community. So it is like, let the dead bury their dead. Yes, for us, we have acquired our papers. Why should I go out to interact with the poor? I mean, then how will the poor value you? How will the poor know that you're relevant to them? Yes, you did your degree and you got your papers, but you, you, you know that the poor people are having a conflict in society and you're not even going there to help them to resolve the conflict. But you're saying, I have a degree in peace and conflict studies. That is the only thing you can tell them. But they have never witnessed or seen you at any occasion being a peace builder then how are people going to value you telling them that I have a degree in peace and conflict? Please justify your degree in peace and conflict by engaging with the community, solving problems within the community, be a mediator in simple, in resolving simple problems. It could be family problems, it could be land problems, it could be any problem within the community. You're talking about the hygiene. People are, the streets are dirty, you're also dirty, you're also littering. But the very person also who is throwing that you have your degree in social sciences, but you are the very person who is also throwing the same litter through the, 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 the window outside. I mean, then you're not any different. We should be the one to be showing example, the community. When we are exemplary, when we are examples to the community, then we shall be role models to the community. And therefore the community will start seeing sense in us. And that is when the social scientists will be valued. Then we also need life skills. I'll summarize. We need the skills, life skill of focus and self-control. We need to understand what others think and their perspectives, skills of communication. Some of these have already talked about them. We need to make the right connections. I think this is a new one. Making right connections is important because it will help you as a social scientist to understand and appreciate diversity. We are in a global world, therefore make right connections. It helps you even to become more creative and learn from time to time. Life skills also requires taking on challenges. As social scientists, we should not avoid challenges. We should take on challenges, confront the challenges, and come up with strategies for solving them. We should understand that the world is about solving problems. And we should know that successful people are the ones that look for problems in society and they come up with solutions. Our students, when it comes to time for, for doing research, they get phobia also. They, they, they get goose pimples because they don't know that as a social scientist, you're supposed to research about social problems. Then they'll ask you, how do I get a problem? A problem does not come from heaven. A problem for a social scientist means 
you look at the problems in your society. But because we are not interacting with society or we don't care about the problems of society, it becomes very difficult for us to design research problems. But a research problem is a problem that is in your society that you witness, that people talk about, and anything that you've seen or written about, it becomes a problem. So let's look at problems in society and look for ways of solving them. There's this quote that uh, when man suffered with eating raw food, they discovered fire. So can we make discoveries in our society? Yes. Engage learning goals and strategies for self-directed learning, get attuned and better prepared to change as the world changes. Then lifelong learning and fostering inner curiosity can help social scientists to realize their full potential. Okay, I will conclude. In my conclusion, many people are graduating from universities each year and many people get jobs, others don't have. But how do we position ourselves Amid is the negative remarks about the social sciences. Social scientists should be at the forefront of correcting the misconceptions by proving their relevancy. And we can prove our relevancy by having a new caliber of social scientists who are empowered, creative, innovative, who are critical thinkers, who have strong values and ability to del deliberate and design alternative strategies that respond to not only social challenges, but also the challenges that are brought about by technology. I already mentioned the growing negative impact of social media, for instance, is one of a social challenge that has been brought about by technology. So how do we deal with such things? As scientists, I mean as social scientists, please, it should be a question to you. Finally, I'm saying social scientists should serve with attention to detail. We should provide a service above self. So that brings me to the end of this discussion. I thank all of you for attending. I will welcome some submissions and reactions to the presentation. Thank you very much, yes. uh, Dr. Wabule, for an excellent presentation on the social sciences and its role in society. Um, mine is a quick one. Uh, and I agree with you that um, social sciences and the natural sciences are complementary. They complement each other, as you put it um, in your presentation. Um, now, in that regard, and in view of the policy that um, uh, is currently prevailing in terms of uh, wage discrimination, uh in, in the teaching profession we all recognize that um, this this payment um, of science teachers and payment of arts teachers is, is, is for the teaching aspect it is not for any scientific invention or anything that science teachers are doing uh, so i was hoping that you would uh, interrogate the, the, the subject a little bit further and offer some alternatives to what is happening on the ground in regards to the, the, the wage differential, which is causing a lot of anxiety and discontent among uh, the, 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 the teachers. So your comments. Number two, um, I, I don't know if I got you right, but uh, you mentioned desk research in terms in, in relation to social sciences. Uh, I don't know whether you you were that 
social scientists actually don't do empirical research, or maybe I didn't get you right, please kindly elaborate on that, uh, because we know that in, in social sciences, we also do uh, empirical research. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Prof, for those observations. Uh, I'll start with the, the second one on uh, desk research vis-a-vis -vis empirical research. What I was trying to imply was that oftentimes when social scientists, I was talking about uh, lack of honesty and truthfulness when social scientists are either hired or consulted to do research about social problems. Oftentimes, majority of the people that are consulted to do or who win consultancies to conduct research on the social problems, they don't bother to go to the field to do empirical research. They will sit their desks and do this research and simply keep refining a few things here and there based on hearsay, maybe social media and so on. We don't bother to get out into the field and immerse ourselves in society to understand the actual problems of society. So what I'm trying to say is, we tend to produce reports that are based on desk research and then because of this honesty, we don't add much value to, to, to the reports that we produce. And therefore, if we don't get out to the communities and add value and show something new with our findings, then we are reproducing, we, re we are recycling the same knowledge that does not add value to what people already know. And because of that, people will not see much that we are adding to society. They are not seeing any much value because if you're telling the same story in the same way without adding anything, then you're not adding anything. So I was advocating for moving away from desk research and getting out for empirical research. That is what I was saying. Uh, uh, so, uh, Dr. Wabule, um, are you implying that that malpractice is the um, is official and it's widespread in the social sciences, or it is something that uh, some advice you could give to social scientists? I think um, that malpractice is not the. It, it, I, I I wouldn't look at it as the official way social scientists do research. Uh, the few people who do like who who do that may. May, may be, the, but they, I think they, they are out of order uh, as regards official practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Okay, maybe taking it from, from my approach to research, when I, when, I, when I speak like that, I'm simply giving examples. I'm not generalizing, but I'm just sharing a view in as far as research dishonesty is concerned. I'm not, uh, I'm not attacking it to any social scientist. I'm not attacking it, attaching it to any numbers, but I'm simply sharing this as something that goes on sometimes, which is dishonest in research. So when people are, so that people who are doing research, in case someone was tempted not to do authentic research, they can reflect and say, okay, it is right that if it is empirical data, let me do both desk research and also get out of the field so that I can get something new. So I'm not generalizing that it happens with every researcher, but I'm just giving it as uh, something that uh, happens once in a while. Yes, because it is proven that okay. many people don't produce okay. authentic reports. And I was giving even an example of, uh, of the MPs yesterday who are saying that uh, many state of inquiry have been taken on Karamoja from the time of Bali dams until today's issue of, of iron sheets. But no authentic report has been produced about Karamoja. They simply keep recycling the same thing, implying that nobody bothers to even go and find out the actual problems of Karamoja. People are saying, why is it that 
Yes, a lot of money goes to Karamoja, but the same scandals every year, every year with every project that goes to Karamoja. Then uh, they, they do commissions of inquiry that bring reports that are recycling the same thing. Do those people really go to the field? So that is why I was using this example. So I'm not generalizing that uh, all researchers are dishonest, but I was just picking up a few examples here and there to explain the point of the relevancy of social scientists embedding in the society and understanding social problems and designing solutions that respond to those problems so that they become more relevant. Then Prof going by the to going to the back to the, to the, to the first question about, uh, about the salary disparities between the science. I don't for me, I don't call them science teachers, but I, I call them teachers of science and teachers of arts. I think maybe because I don't know, I don't know, but it, it is unfair, it is an injustice because. When, first of all, when people are training and you qualify as a teacher, you qualify with a diploma in education, or you qualify with a degree in education. Then for, for the past teachers, you may have done sciences as a teacher, you qualify as a teacher of science, but you all underwent through the same processes. And when you go to class, for instance, I'm here, a teacher of social sciences, giving this webinar. But we have had earlier webinars with, for instance, Dr. Kimise, who is a teacher of IT. I'm sure that that time and the effort I've put in this webinar is equal to the time and effort that Dr. Kimi said that Dr. Ijo put in his. We all prepared. We've all spent one hour here. We've all talked to people. We've all labored. So we are being paid for the service that we've offered. So to me, salary disparities indeed, and I've, 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 I've talked with the teachers in secondary schools, they have caused a lot of divisions in the schools where there is there are crossroads between science teachers and, 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 and arts teachers. But again, this is a social problem. We, when we bring it back to the field of social sciences, this is a social problem that is going to impact our education system holistically. Because if there is if there are wrangles between the teachers in the same school, they are sitting in the same staff room, but they don't talk. It means, oh God, Sandra, hello. Yeah, hi, Dr. Wabule. Yeah. I'm kindly prepared to wrap up because we have overrun the session. Yes, I'm ending, I'm ending, thank you. So I was saying, as social scientists, I think this is one of the problems that we are having in our society. And therefore we should get out and do research not simply watch teachers talking, making comments on, 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 on TV, on radio, on social media. I think this is one of the problems that the current problems we have in our society that social scientists should address and come up with solutions in form of advice on how this policy can be improved or revised in order to have holistic improvement in our education system. Otherwise, with the dissatisfaction that some teachers have and uh, the, the, the crossroads at which they are living or they are working in the work environment, it is going to impact education because there's a lot of unfairness. But as social scientists, it is like, let the teachers carry their cross. How many of us have stood with the teachers in this struggle? So how can the teachers see social scientists as, a, as, as, as being helpful, as being relevant, when we have left them to carry their own cross, including myself. We should be out there empathizing with the teachers, doing research on this issue 
going to the schools, finding out the real issues, the actual challenge, and we document and we struggle with them to advocate for policy change if need be. If it means saying all the teachers, well, let it be done, than having a section of teachers being paid higher than others. But it requires all of us to have concerted effort. And like I said, when we get to the communities and understand community problems and we empathize with those people and we document and we talk about them and we find joint solutions to such problems, then we shall be relevant. But when we remain in our ivory towers and we leave teachers with their problem, policemen with their problem, these people with their problem, poor people with their problem. Right now we have the money for, they are calling it what? Parish development model with their problem. If we don't do enough so that we are visible out there, then the unfairness will continue, but also our relevance will be less felt. So I think, uh, I don't know whether I've answered uh, Dr. E. Joel, but that is my submission. Ooh, the yeah, number yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, I, I guess I agree with you. Um, I think, um, the policy could be better. I, I think that's for another day. Okay. So thank you so much. Going by the alert by Sandra, I don't see any other person asking a question. So I would like to thank every person that uh, turned up for this uh, webinar. Thanks for listening to me. Thanks for the observations that were given by Professor Ijo, I'll end there and wish you a good day.